Hello everyone and welcome to the back room. In this video I'm doing a little bit of PC archaeology into a largely forgotten area of home computing from the middle to late 2000s, the net top or as VIA called their entry into the field, the bare bone storage PC. Specifically in this video the Artigo A2000 from 2008 which is a miniature PC from Taiwanese chipset designer VIA intended as an intelligent replacement for NAS hard drives. Now I realise that for some viewers this will stretch the definition of retro beyond breaking point, but for me the net top makes for an obscure but interesting also ran in personal computer development. The name net top is a concatenation of network and desktop and generally describes small form factor PC compatibles intended as low power thin client alternatives to traditional desktop computers. They flourished briefly and then disappeared in the wake of ever more powerful smartphones and increasingly powerful mini personal computers such as the Mac Mini which offered miniature computing without compromise. VIA was founded in 1987 in California and is a fabulous semiconductor manufacturer of motherboard chipsets, CPUs and memory. In 1992 the company's headquarters were relocated to Taiwan and among other acquisitions it absorbed Cyrix. VIA played a leading role in developing ITX, Mini ITX and Pico ITX motherboards and chipsets and that's kind of relevant here in that the VIA Artigo A2000 is a tiny almost toy-like yet fully functioning PC intended to act as a home server. It features VIA's own 1.5 gig C7 processor and VX800 chipset, both specifically designed for such a project and to compete with similar offerings from Intel, Nvidia and others. What is immediately obvious is just how nicely put together the Artigo is. The neat back panel is largely taken up by the fan but there's a VGA port, sound in and out, two USB 2 ports and an Ethernet port as well as a 12 volt power connector. Let's have a look at the rest of the specs. The machine features a tiny motherboard with a C7 CPU and VX800 chipset. There's a single SODIMM socket which supports up to 2 gigs and there's a 2 gig chip installed. A bootable compact flash socket currently populated with an 8 gig card and optional 802.11b Wi-Fi. My machine doesn't have this option and instead I'm using an external USB Wi-Fi adapter. The A2000 supports two SATA hard drives which slide into place on rails and plug directly into a daughter board set at right angles to the main board. This makes installing a drive very easy indeed. Arguably its most interesting feature is the bootable compact flash slot. By installing an operating system to this card both SATA drives are entirely available for whatever purpose you have in mind. I spotted this Artigo being given away free on Facebook Marketplace together with a number of other old PC boards and accessories such as an LG IDE DVD writer which you'll see later in this video. Free is always my favourite price and minutes after contacting the owner I was on my way to collect it. The Artigo came complete with its packaging, an explanatory quick start guide sheet and an 8GB CF card but there were no drives installed. Also missing was its original external power supply but as that's just a 12 volt DC brick I used an 80 watt example from a previous Mini ITX build. I had no idea whether the machine actually worked and the owner was entirely uninterested in engaging in a conversation about it so with the box on my bench it was time to open the packaging and go exploring. The interior is neatly laid out though mounting the memory chip can be rather awkward. Below the SODIMM is the CF card socket and beyond this nestling inside the chassis rails is a CMOS backup battery wrapped up in electrical tape which I assume is a CR2032. As a general rule these batteries don't leak but it's nice to see the battery sighted well away from the main board. I decided to deal with the battery first and pried it off the bottom of the case. Unwrapping it I discovered the reason for the tape. The terminals weren't actually soldered but simply held in place with the tape. 
I dug out a battery holder from my store and lengthened the leads to the motherboard to make it easier to change the battery. After soldering these in place, I stuck in a new battery and tested for power at the connector, which showed three volts, as you can see here. I cut up a bit of sticky bag Velcro to mount the battery holder in the case. And finally, with it back inside the case, I tested for shorts against the chassis. I have a number of SATA drives liberated from old TiVo boxes and the like, so I located this 160 gig example, mounted it in the A2000, and then put the case back together. Now it was time to see if the A2000 would actually work. There's no optical drive in the Artigo and the SATA drive I'd installed was blank so I needed to find out what media it would boot from. Moments after switching on the machine displayed a VIA splash screen and at that point I knew at least that it was working. I pressed Dell to pull up the BIOS settings and scrolled through the boot device options which showed that it would boot from a floppy, a zip drive or an optical drive connected via USB, as well as internal options such as the hard drive and the compact flash. First I tried a USB floppy drive and a copy of DOS 6.22 but that didn't boot. I also tried a USB memory stick configured to look like a CD-ROM with a copy of Linux Mint but again to no avail. I don't have a USB optical drive, but then I remembered the LG DVD writer that had come in the box of bits along with the Artigo. This drive is IDE, but I do have an IDE to USB adapter. I pulled out an ATX PSU to power it up, and with everything connected up, I set the BIOS to boot from USB CD-ROM, 
and tried booting with a copy of Windows XP, which actually worked perfectly. The Artigo recognised the driver and booted up happily. At this point I installed XP on the SATA drive, set the BIOS to boot from internal hard drive and once again tried booting which worked just fine. So far so good, but in 2023 Windows XP on a PC of this vintage would be little more than a curiosity and I wanted to see if the A2000 could still be used productively. And that of course would mean Linux. I decided on Linux Mint and selected version 19.3 which is the last to support 32 bits. I also opted for the minimalist XFCE edition. The machine seemed to match Mint's requirements and I thought it would be perfect. Time to deploy the LG DVD writer again. I connected it to my M2 Mac running Ventura 13.4, downloaded an ISO of Mint and loaded up a blank DVD. The Mac recognised the drive and cheerfully allowed me to right click the ISO and burn it to disk. A few minutes later I had a Linux Mint DVD ready to go. Back at the Artigo I tried to boot but once again the machine refused, it was simply hanging up. Clearly I needed something that placed only the minimum demands on the system. After casting about I discovered Puppy Linux, a really compact amalgam of several Linux distros which nonetheless offers a usable interface for an older machine in a contemporary setting. I selected Bionic Pop 32 version 8 which is compatible with Ubuntu, downloaded an ISO, burned it to disk and booted it. The A2000 ran flawlessly. From the menu I selected an install to the compact flash and when that was done I rebooted. However despite making the card bootable from within Puppy, the machine would boot to XB from the hard drive and ignore the Linux on the flash card. Back at the BIOS I realised that as well as setting first, second and third boot options, the machine required a boot priority to be set. Having placed the flash card first in the priority list, I tried again and yep, Puppy booted perfectly. So now I had two OS's installed and both booted without problem, but could Linux be used productively on the A2000? Let's try. I downloaded Firefox and installed it to Puppy without a hitch, after which I opened the browser and pointed it at the BBC. There was of course a distinct and noticeable lag in opening the application, and it certainly took some time to build the BBC's image-rich homepage. 
But that said, the page did indeed open and the browser did not balk at any page furniture or anything else it didn't like. Scrolling is slow of course, but I would say it's just about usable. Opening the task manager, we can see that Firefox is making a fairly heavy demand on processor time, but together with OS housekeeping, we're only using about a quarter of the available 2 gig memory. For a highly compact distro, Poppy tries hard to provide a comprehensive selection of applications. Closing Firefox, I launched the well-known AbbeyWord word processor from the taskbar. AbbeyWord is small, quick to open and it doesn't lag, even with a good number of pages of text loaded. It has a reputation for being buggy here and there, but I've used it many times previously without a problem. It is relatively big on features for such a small application and I've yet to discover its supposed 20 page limit. No doubt everyone watching this will have their own favourite word processor. Also on the taskbar is the equally well known numeric spreadsheet. Scrolling through the system menus we can see that again Poppy tries hard to offer a good quota of useful bits and pieces making it worthwhile install and a hugely more useful OS than Windows XP. At some point I might try an install of Windows 7 on the machine, but for now I'm pleased that it's working and usable, and now it's time to start customising Poppy to suit the way I like to work. Thank you for watching this instalment of The Backroom Boy, I'll see you all again very soon.